so we have a lot of different things to do today. So, um, and some of those are a little bit more challenging than others. So uh, it might take a little bit of thought. I know that's a mean thing to ask you to do on a Thursday afternoon of sixth week, um, but it will uh, help us out in the long run if we can sort of think through logically some of the, the ways that the ocean and the atmosphere interact. Because really, we're talking a lot about the atmosphere, but 70% of Earth's surface is the ocean. And unlike the land, when the wind moves across the land, it doesn't really make a huge difference to the land surface. We might get sort of different amounts of movement of the vegetation, or we might move sediment around. But when the atmosphere interacts with the ocean, then we create movement of the ocean. And so what we're going to focus on today is really that interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. So how the atmosphere goes about moving the ocean around, but also in turn how the ocean can have a, an influence on our climate system. It's very much a coupled system. They interact together. So as a quick reminder, quiz six is available from 4 p.m. today until 11 a.m. Tuesday as normal. If we don't quite get to the end today, there may be a little bit of a delay because I might have to rewrite one of the questions. So I don't want to rush today. I'd much rather that we actually understand. So, midterms. I will be releasing the grades later today. In general, <laughs> there's a terror, oh my goodness. That's the most reaction I've heard from you all quarter. Um, in general, I was really pleased. A whole bunch of people did really, really well, and I'm delighted because it was not an easy exam. Okay, so I think the, the mean, the average was about 63 out of 85, equates to about 75%. Okay, it's about what it was last year, if not a little better than last year's class, so well done. Um, so I think most of you, or a lot of you, will be really pleased. Um, saying that, I'm sure that there will be a few of you that are really quite disappointed. Um, and what I want to say to you is that if you just didn't study and you didn't do well because of that, then I'm afraid there's a fairly obvious answer. But if you studied really hard and you just didn't feel like you were getting anywhere or you just don't feel that you're getting it, please do make an appointment to come and see me. I'm really delighted to try and help you out um, and we can try and find different ways that you can study perhaps to try and get that information into your head a little bit more. But in general, I was really pleased and I hope you are too when you get your grades back, okay? And don't be scared if the averages are slightly lower. Um, than perhaps other classes. Okay, any questions about the midterms? No? Okay, so I'll release those later tonight, so do check on that. So what are we going to do today? Well, first of all, I would like to review our three-cell conceptual model because we're going to come back to some of these ideas of the easterlies and westerlies today. They're really one of the things that drives our ocean circulation and in particular creates the patterns that we see in the North Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, South Pacific. So we'll take a look at the three-cell conceptual model again. And then we're going to look at sort of two particular aspects of ocean-atmosphere interactions. Um, and these are just two of many, many possible ways that we could look at these. So first of all, we're going to look at ocean circulation. Because the oceans are a really important way that we move energy around the Earth. Just like the atmosphere moves energy by that movement of wind, the movement of water moves a huge amount of energy um, around the Earth and so it influences our climate here on land an awful lot. So we're going to look at surface circulation and work out how those winds actually drive those surface currents and what patterns we see as a result of that. Um, and as part of that, we're going to look at why we have such amazing marine ecosystems and ama amazing amounts of life along our particular coastline, our California coastline. That's due to the wind patterns we see at certain times of the year. We're also going to look at why we, or, or who's heard of the great garbage patch in the Pacific? Most people, right? So we're going to have a look at why the winds sort of interact and create that particular sort of garbage patch. And we don't just have one in the North Pacific. We also have one in the North Atlantic, in the South Atlantic, in the South Pacific. Um, then we're going to get to, if we, if we have time, um, so sort of deep ocean circulation, which is more density driven, but again, it has a huge impact on our climate. We're going to look at the day after tomorrow scenario and uh, think about whether that's actually realistic or not. And then very lastly today, we're going to look at El Nino. 
And most people have heard of El Nino, and you may even have heard it in the news recently, um, because there may well be an El Nino event later this year. And so we're going to look at what that means, what that uh, means in terms of how the atmosphere affects the Pacific Ocean and affects the temperatures on different sides. Okay? So lots of really cool stuff to do today. So let's start first off with our three-cell conceptual model. And you are going to be so fed up of seeing this by the end of the quarter. But it's really important and it's really amazing because it explains so much of what we observed in our satellite images of the Earth over a year. Amazing amounts. Okay? So it explains why we have our little band of cloud, why we have what we call the intertropical convergence zone, or ITCZ for short, that runs along the equator. It explains why we have our trade winds, our easterly winds, either side of the equator. So easterly, if you're looking at me from your angle. Okay? It explains why we have our westerlies, why the storms that hit us come from the Pacific Ocean rather than coming the other way across the US. It explains why we have our deserts where we have them, where, where we have really dry conditions up at the poles, but also in the subtropics where we are, or at least on the edge of where we are, um, and around the Sahara Desert and in Australia as well. So it really can explain all of these amazing things. There are a couple of things, though, that our model can't explain just because it's so simplistic. And that is, first of all, it doesn't take into account that the Earth is not all land or not all water. We have these different distributions of land and ocean, and they warm up and cool down at different uh, rates from the ocean, and that does affect the pressure that we see in the atmosphere and affect some of those wind conditions, and we'll talk more about that on Tuesday. And the second thing that our beautiful model can't explain is what's happening in the upper atmosphere. Okay? Because in reality, remember we had our warm air column, and we had our cold air column and the molecules in our warm air column are much more spread out and so as you go up in the atmosphere you have to go up a lot further to see significant drops in pressure. Whereas in our cold air column all of those molecules are really packed tight together and so as we go up then we very sort of quickly drop in pressure. And so by the time we get high up in the atmosphere we have nice warm air columns over much of the sort of equator towards almost up to sort of 60 degrees north or so and then very very quickly over that polar front we switch to very cold air columns the other side and that difference in temperature creates big differences in pressure across that polar front and it generates our jet streams. So I hope that everyone brought pen and paper today if not you should speak nicely to your neighbor who has because we're going to be doing lots and lots of drawing. So. Let us do our three-cell conceptual model very quickly. I think it's much more helpful if we draw this. So, I'm getting better and better at perfect circles. So, let's have a look. Here we have our equator. Here we have 30 degrees north. 60 degrees north. And 90 degrees north. Do the same in the southern hemisphere, 30 degrees south, 60 degrees south, 90 degrees south. So what's our first circulation cell? What is the circulation cell that we see either side of the equator? The Hadley cell. So where is it theoretically warmest on our model Earth? At the equator. And so we know that warm air will rise. Okay, so we have warm air rising at the equator. It doesn't just continue going out to space. At a certain point it will start to spread out and it spreads out both towards the north and towards the south. Okay, but by the time it's traveled 30 degrees of latitude towards the pole in either direction, remember that we're not, we still need to take into account the Coriolis force. And by the time it's gone 30 degrees or so, then it's sort of deflected by so much that it's not going north-south anymore. Instead, the air is traveling sort of around and around the Earth instead. And so at that point, it's not going to make it any further towards our poles. That air is going to sink back down. Okay. And then we sort of close the loop 
to make our little closed circulation cell. So both of these are our Hadley cells. We have one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere. Okay? But if we have air sinking back to the surface, it's not just going to flow back to the equator. It's also going to flow in the other direction. It's also going to flow to the north like this, to the south like this. But again, we have exactly the same problem. By the time that air has moved 30 degrees of latitude, it's no longer going north-south. The Coriolis force has deflected it, and now it's going sideways. It's going east-west around the world again. And so at this point, what we see is that air starts to rise. Okay? And once it rises, it doesn't keep going out to space. It reaches a point where it will spread out in both north and southerly directions. Okay. By the time we get to the pole, there's nowhere else for that air to go. Air is converging on that point from all directions. So air sinks back down. And then it will return back. We can complete our cell again. Okay. So these are our feral in the middle and our polar cells in both hemispheres. So really, if you can get the point to the point where air rises at the equator, the rest of it more or less draws itself. With a little bit of practice, it more or less draws itself. So let's think of some implications for the fact that we have these three circulation cells. So let's do our little chant again. What happens as air rises? Does it compress or expand? Expands. Does it warm up or cool down? cools down. So do we get clouds and rainfall or sunny skies? Clouds and rainfall. It's one of our lifting mechanisms, right? So as we have this air rising, we get clouds and rainfall. What other latitudes do I get clouds and rainfall at? Is it 30? 60. It's 60. This is the other place where we have air rising from the surface up into the higher in the atmosphere. So we have clouds and rainfall here, clouds and rainfall here. At the poles, and also at 30 degrees north and south, air is sinking from higher in the atmosphere back to the surface. So is it expanding or compressing? Compressing, is it warming up or cooling down? Warming up. So we're moving away from saturation. We're moving away from our big sort of saturation curve. And so we're not going to see clouds and rainfall very often. We tend to have these nice sunny skies. Okay? And that can be a surprise for people at the poles because we think of the poles as cold and everything else. It can still be really cold where it's sunny. Anyone that's been to Europe, often in the winter when we have high pressure moving through, when it's clear, it's really cold because we don't have those clouds to act as sort of insulating layers for us anymore. So if we're lifting air away from the surface, we're taking air away, are we going to be left with high or low pressure at the surface? If you let air out of your tires, are you left with higher or lower pressure in your tires? Low. So if we're lifting air away from the surface, we're going to leave lower pressure behind. So again, we see low at the equator, low up at 60 degrees north, 60 degrees south, if we're putting air back into your tires, or if we're piling air down at the surface, are we going to see high or low pressure? High. So wherever we see air returning back down, we get a high. OK. So our diagram's starting to look a little bit messy. So the last thing that we're going to do is draw in our patterns of easterlies and westerlies. And remember, you still only need to know two things, that air goes from does it go from high to low or low to high? High to low, absolutely. And where, which direction do you get deflected in the northern hemisphere? To the right. And if you can do those two things, you can draw in the rest of the patterns. So in our northern hemisphere, I'm going to go from high to low, and I'm going to be deflected to the right. OK? From high to low, and I have to turn it around for this, because I can't do left and right at the best of times. So high to low to the right, high to low 
to the right. And then in the southern hemisphere, which way do I get deflected? To the left. Okay, high to low and to the left. High to low, to the left. High to low, to the left. Okay? So we see that we have our lovely three-cell conceptual model that explains our easterlies and our westerlies. It explains why we have bands of clouds and rainfall and clouds of much sunnier skies and more desert-like conditions. It's a really amazing model, uh, to be honest. It's pretty astounding. Where does our polar jet stream flow? Where on our diagram would our polar jet streams be? So the boundary between two cells, right? So which two cells? The feral and the polar. Do you remember this? So we have our polar front that forms at the boundary between our feral cell and our polar cell. And let's think about why that is. That's because we have lovely warm air moving up from sort of further south, meeting really, really, really cold air coming down from the pole. So there's a really sharp change in temperature at this particular location. And where we see that really sharp change in temperature, we see a really sharp change in pressure, especially up high. And so our jet streams will be up high in the troposphere, and it will be sort of flowing in this direction around the world. Okay, here's our jet stream. It will basically be above that boundary between the feral cell and the polar cell. Okay? And we don't just get it in the northern hemisphere. We also see exactly the same thing down here in our southern hemisphere. And which way would it flow in our southern hemisphere? Would it go the other way? Or would it go the same direction as the northern hemisphere? So when we thought about which direction the jet stream was flowing in the northern hemisphere, we said that we were going from higher pressure to lower pressure, higher up in the atmosphere, it's high where it's warmer, it's low where it's colder, so high to low and it gets deflected to the right, so the jet stream will go in this direction around the world. So now let's think about the same thing in the southern hemisphere. Our warmer air columns are going to be on this side, our colder air is going to be on this side, so we have high going to low pressure, high up in the atmosphere. Which way is it deflected? To the left. So which way is it going to end up going? The same way, right? It's going to go in this direction around. OK? If that's a struggle, then draw it out for yourself over the weekend. OK. So is everyone happy with the three-cell conceptual model? There's a lot of information on there. But once you see the patterns, it becomes much easier to do. So have a go at drawing it yourself. It's a really good thing. Pin it up on your wall and uh, stare at it before you go to bed. OK? Everyone happy? Right. In that case, let's move on to talk about how this sort of pattern of winds starts affecting our oceans. So ocean circulation, it's really important. Our oceans are not just puddles of water that sit there. They're constantly in motion. And this motion is really important for transporting um, energy, but also matter and storing things like carbon. And so we really care a lot about ocean circulation. Um, and in particular, we have two types. We have the surface circulation. And that's really 400 meters or shallower. So it's really the very top layer of our oceans around the world. And that really is most influenced by the winds. We see that our circulation is driven by the wind. Below 400 meters, so really the majority of our ocean, that movement is instead driven by density differences. Okay? So first of all, because we're in atmosphere class, let's think about the wind-driven circulation, the surface circulation. So first of all, how do we know what our oceans are doing? Well, in the olden days, when people sailed around a lot, people really cared where the ocean currents were going because they didn't have enormous sort of diesel engines to really power them. And so they were much more influenced by currents. 
Um, and so we had a certain idea, but probably sort of pretty patchy records. If we want to understand really what our circulation is doing, we need to measure it and we need to understand how it moves on different time scales. So we can either measure that directly by releasing floating things into the ocean and tracking them through time. We'll have a look at that in a second. Other sort of ways that we can do it is we can fix a propeller somewhere and we can work out which direction and how fast the, the ocean current is going due to that. Satellites now are giving us a much better sense of how the ocean is moving and that's a great help for us. Also, if we track things like temperature or salinity or things like the CFCs that we released into the atmosphere, they're gradually sort of entering the ocean and by tracking them and tracking how far they've gone in the deep ocean, we can get a sense of how the ocean is moving. We also have little accidental experiments that help us out a bit. Um, so if you remember, I ended the last lecture with my little picture of a rubber duck um, that has been circulating around the ocean for a while. Um, and both him and uh, many of his friends, and also various Nike shoes and other stuff, end up in the ocean because every now and again we lose containers off the sides of big ships. Um, and so you can see that um, in 1990 uh, we lost 31,000 pairs of shoes off the side of a ship um, somewhere in the North Pacific. And for a very long time people were finding them washed up around Vancouver and the coast of the US and there was a website set up or people tried to find people with matching shoes so that they could create a pair because they were actually quite wearable, they were pretty good. Um, and then you've got the, the cuter rubber ducks and those things have been going for a really long time now and they've even made it up through the Arctic Ocean, circulated through the sea ice and they've popped out now on the other side in the Atlantic which is really fun. Um, so those guys also have been around. Can anyone think of a less happy accident, or not really an accident at all, that happened um, that has generated a lot of things floating in the Pacific? The Japanese, tsunami. the Japanese tsunami, absolutely. A huge amount of material was washed out to sea by the Japanese tsunami. Um, and that is sort of gradually circulating through the Pacific. And we care to a certain extent about that, partly because in a lot of cases it's people's personal belongings. In some cases we can at least still try and return things. Also there is a, a lot of hazardous material out there um, that could potentially be washing up. And it's already started a little bit washing up along the coast of Alaska, just the occasional sort of thing. But in general this is the forecast for where that material will be. You can see that it's been spreading out through time and it's been circulating through the North Pacific. And these things are very scattered. I, mean, I don't want to give you the impression that we have giant floating islands of stuff coming our way, but this stuff is out there um, and we are keeping an eye on it because uh, if there's sort of refrigerators or um, sort of stuff like that, we don't want it along our shorelines. More scientifically, we have things like this which are really neat. We have either just little drift meters that we dump in the ocean and they have like a little GPS um, and so we can keep track of where they end up. But also more advanced systems are things like our Argo floats and these are really cool things because you dump them in the ocean and they sort of float along and then every few days they'll change the position within the ocean so we don't just get the surface, we also get what's happening at depth. So after a few days it will sort of sink down to one kilometer drift for a while, it'll sink a little bit deeper and then it will ascend all the way to the surface and at the same time it measures temperature and salinity and all sorts of interesting things that we'd like to know. It hits the surface, sends a satellite uh, signal off to sort of broadcast its information and then it goes through the same thing again. So we have a whole bunch of these things in our oceans sort of doing this little cycle on a few days and it keeps going until its batteries die. But these are really expensive and so we don't have as many as we'd like. And lots of different countries have bought them, lots of different institutions. Um, and this is an idea of how many there were out and about in uh, January of this year. Um, and probably a certain number of those are not active anymore at this point. Um, but there's still, we have this sort of better coverage now of what the oceans are doing. And so we can start to see the patterns um, and understand a little bit more. So, how does wind drive the ocean? 
Well, winds move water, but unfortunately for you guys, not in a simple way, I'm afraid, because it's the Earth and we're never simple, right? Um, so you can see on there, um, the green arrows are our wind directions and they should start to look somewhat familiar now. And underneath that, you can also see um, arrows uh, representing ocean currents. And the red ones are nice warm ocean currents. They tend to be the ones going from the equator towards the pole. And then we have the blue arrows representing cold currents, the ones that tend to be going from the pole towards the equator. Okay? But you can see that those currents aren't necessarily following exactly the same pattern as the winds. They're moving sort of with the wind, but not exactly with the wind. So we need to think about why that's happening. So we are going to talk about Ekman transport. And for the 100 or so of you in the room from oceanography or from ESS1, you will remember this. But it's a good idea to go through it again. So we are going to talk about Ekman spirals and Ekman transport. So Ekman spirals are basically what actually happens. Ekman transport is we're, because we're too lazy to think about spirals, so we just average it out. Okay? So I'm going to draw little diagrams to explain what happens as our wind drives our ocean water. So, more drawing. So let's first of all just think about the very top layer of my ocean. Okay? We're just going to think about the very top, say, 10 meters or so of my little ocean. So here's zero meters, this is the surface, and this is 10 meters. And what I'm going to imagine is that I have a wind that is moving in this direction. Okay? This is my wind. And so, if we're thinking about the simplest possible case, if we were thinking about just sort of you blowing across a coffee cup or a wind across a little puddle outside, the water would move the same direction as the wind, right? And that's because that air moving across the surface of the water is generating friction. Okay? The movement of those air molecules basically drags the underlying water molecules along with it. There's friction and that pulls that water along. But what do we have to take into account given that we're spinning the Coriolis force again. Unfortunately, here comes the Coriolis force again, messing everything up. So, let's say that we're in the northern hemisphere. Which way is my Coriolis force going to act? To the right. It's going to act at 90 degrees to the right. So, say my water tries to move with the wind, it's going to feel a force at 90 degrees to the right of that in this direction. Okay? So, this is my Coriolis force. <coughs> And this is my wind direction. Okay? So which way does the water actually end up moving? Yeah, in between the two. So my wind or my water rather will end up moving in this direction. Okay? So that's the way that my water will end up moving. But that's not the end of my story. So let's think back. Now let's think about the second layer of my ocean. So that's just the top 10 meters or so. So what happens underneath that? So now we're going to go from 10 meters down to 20 meters depth in my ocean. Does the water in this layer feel the atmosphere or wind or anything else? No, the wind is up above, right? It's not directly feeling the movement of that air. What is it feeling the movement of? the water immediately above. So now what's driving the movement of the water in this layer isn't the wind, it's the movement of that water in the layer immediately above. And which direction is that water going in? It's going off to the side like this, right? So now that's our overlying water, okay? That's the force that's trying to get the water in this layer to move. But we have our Coriolis force. And what direction does it act in? 90 degrees to the right. OK. So this is 90 degrees. This is our Coriolis force. So where does the water in this layer end up moving? In between those. OK. So this is where our water ends up moving. 
So I'll do one last layer just to hammer the point home. So you can probably predict this, see if you can draw it ahead of me. So now if we think from 20 meters to 30 meters, which way is the overlying water wanting my layer to move? In this direction. So the overlying water is moving in this direction now. That's what wants to force this layer of water to move. But the Coriolis force acts at 90 degrees to the right. And so the water in this layer ends up moving whoops, in this direction. Okay, So you can see that for each extra layer we go down, the water might start moving in a spiral. Okay? So if we were to look down from the top, okay, if we were to look down at my sort of square of ocean, my wind might be moving in this direction, but the water actually ends up moving in this direction, and then this direction, and then this direction, and then it keeps going. Okay? So as you're moving down through the water, you're basically spiraling. Okay? So that's how that wind is driving the water. So that's our Ekman spiral. This is our Ekman spiral. Does that make sense to everybody? More or less? Don't want to lose you at this point. Yep, confident? OK. So I included a little explanation there, if you didn't get that down. But I think the diagrams are a much clearer explanation. But if you want a written explanation, there is one there. And so tell me, for my little diagram there, what hemisphere am I in? I am in the northern or southern hemisphere. So which direction is my water being deflected? Good work. Yes, absolutely. We're in the northern hemisphere. It's basically what I just drew, right? So if we're in the southern hemisphere, it would spiral to the left. But we're in the northern hemisphere, so we're spiraling to the right. OK, great. So, let's think about some of the implications of the fact that this water moves at different angles from my, uh, my wind. And in particular, we're going to look at uh, things that uh, result from the continents getting in the way. So unlike the atmosphere, every now and again there might be a mountain, but the, the air can usually travel over that. We have a huge thickness of atmosphere, but the oceans cannot travel past continents in the way. And so we have vertical motions of uh, water that result from that. And we call this upwelling or downwelling. Upwelling is the movement of deeper water to the surface. Downwelling is the movement of surface water down. Okay? So it's fairly self-explanatory. So if we have a look at my diagrams here, you can see on the left, I'm showing upwelling. I'm showing that my wind direction is moving along the coastline. Okay? And in, if we assume that we're in the northern hemisphere, that means that that surface water is going to move to the right. And do you remember we were talking about Ekman spirals versus Ekman transport? Let me go back a couple. Those Ekman spirals is how the water is actually moving, but it's really quite complicated to think of it like that. What we instead do is we say, OK, well, if we averaged up, all of that spiral, the average way that the water is moving is at 90 degrees to the right in the northern hemisphere, 90 degrees to the left of the wind in the southern hemisphere. So that's what our Ekman transport says. So if I look at my little diagrams here, we're in the northern hemisphere, and I can tell that because the surface water, this Ekman transport arrow, is moving at 90 degrees to the right of that wind direction. Okay? And if we look at this, that wind direction is coming in this direction. Our Eggman transport is moving at 90 degrees to the right of that wind. Okay? But now we have a problem. Because in this little diagram here, that wind is moving all of our surface water away from the land. So what we're saying is that that wind is moving that top sort of few hundred meters of water. It's moving it away from land, away from the shore. 
And we're not going to end up with a giant hole in our ocean next to the land. We're going to have to bring water from somewhere to replace that. And the only place that we can bring water from is from underneath. Okay? If you imagine that water is moving away from land all along the coastline, then the only place that we can get water from is from underneath. And so that's where upwelling comes in. We have that water from deeper down brought to the surface. In my second diagram on the right, now you can see that my wind goes the other way. And now that top layer of the ocean, that top few hundred meters, is all being forced onto the land. And that water isn't going to hit land and go up and go over the mountains until it hits the other side. It's going to get stuck. And as it gets pushed against the land, some of it will be forced downwards. Okay? So when we have water moving towards the land, it's forced down. It's called downwelling. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Yeah? So, tell me, along our coastline of California, if that's our wind direction for much of the year in spring, late or sort of early summer, does upwelling or downwelling happen? So speak to your neighbor for a second. Ask them. Ooh, 60, 30, I'll take it. OK, and you would be right. OK, so let's have a think about what's happening. So I saw lots of people do this, OK? And that's a good thing, because I know that what you're doing is you're looking along the direction of arrow. Right? So if you look along the direction of arrow, and we look at what hemisphere are we in? The northern hemisphere. So it's going to go, our water is going to go at 90 degrees to the right of that arrow. Yes? Yep. So if you look, 90 degrees to the right of that arrow is away from land. Yes? OK. And so if we have water, all of our water at the coast moving away from land, then that means that we're not going to end up with a giant hole in our ocean next to the, the coastline. We're going to have to bring up water from underneath to replace it. Okay? So we do indeed have lots of upwelling happening off the coast of California. And that's a really good thing for us. Because that deeper water, when it comes to the surface, it's colder, it's saltier, but it contains a whole bunch of nutrients. It has lots of dissolved nitrogen, phosphorus, things that life wants to use. And so the nice thing is, is that when we have this upwelling, it really fuels our amazing ecosystem that we see off the coast here. And anyone who's been to the Aquarium of the Pacific or Monterey Bay Aquarium knows that we have amazing amounts of life along the coast here. It's a really cool place to be. And if you, especially if you're a scuba diver, you know this as well. Um, it also means that we get fog for much of, of that time because this really cold water coming to the surface keeps our coastline cooler. And do you remember that as air moves across that really cold water, it tends to lose heat. And so it cools down that air and it can cool it down until it hits saturation and that's when we get our fogs. So it's a really good thing that we have our upwelling system off the coast here. It also helps out our fisheries agencies as well. So, second thing that we're going to do today is gyres. This is the second complicated thing that we're going to do. So again, we're going to draw this. But the way that it's the simplest way for you guys to think about gyres is to think of them just like high pressure systems and geostrophic flow around that. Okay? So we're going to do the same sort of rules that we had before. So, gyres are big circular systems that occur in our oceans due to the continent positions and those different wind patterns. So, next piece of paper. So do you remember I had my three cell conceptual model here? So if we were to think, I don't know, about, let's do the Pacific Ocean, for example. So here, I'm pretty bad at geography. Here's the US. Here's Asia. Okay, and so here's our North Pacific Ocean. And so now we have to start thinking about how those patterns that we observe in our easterlies and our westerlies are going to affect the movement of our ocean. 
So I'm going to do this on here, and then if you want, I can do it again on a fresh piece of paper. But I think it's nice for you to see how it all corresponds. Okay? So those black arrows are our wind directions um, in the Pacific Ocean. Okay? It's our North Pacific Ocean right here. So if we're in the Northern Hemisphere and our wind is moving in this direction, which way is our surface water going to go as a result of those winds? Is it going to go north or south? It's going to go north. It's going to go at 90 degrees to the right of those winds. Does that make sense? So our Eggman transport means that our surface water is moving at 90 degrees to the right of our easterly trade winds. Okay? But hang on a second. Let's think about our westerlies now. So if we think about our westerlies, which way is surface water going to move as a result of those? Is it going to go south or north? It's going to go south because, again, we're going to go at 90 degrees to the right of these winds, which is in this direction. Okay. So what's happening is that our easterly winds near the equator and our westerly winds further north, all of them act to force water into the very middle of our Pacific Ocean. You can imagine the same thing happening in the Atlantic Ocean. If we do it in the Southern Hemisphere, which way does the water go as a result of these winds? To the left, like that. Okay, and it goes to the left of here. My arrows are getting more dodgy. Okay, and again, those two different wind directions force water into the middle. And so what we get in the middle of our Pacific, our North Pacific, is basically a little hill, a little high in sea level. Okay? All of that water is being pushed by the winds into the middle. It creates a very sort of small hill. Okay? Does water like being a hill? No. What is it going to do? It's going to try and flow outwards. Okay? So those winds are forcing that air in, oh, sorry, the, the water into the middle. It creates a, basically a little hill, okay, or a high. And we know that things go from high to low. So currents are going to try and flow out from that high. Which way are they going to be deflected as they go outwards? In the northern hemisphere. To the right, okay. So as water tries to go out of this high, it ends up going to the right. And so we end up, just like we had in the free atmosphere and, and air moving around our high pressure system in a clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere, we see water moving like that. Does that make sense or do you want me to draw it again? Draw it again, okay. So let's do this on a cleaner bit of paper. So let's do it for the North Atlantic this time, okay. So here is the USA, here's my equator, here's Europe, okay? So around my equator, which way do my winds go? Easterly, yes, thank you. Someone at the front. So my winds are going this direction near the equator. But what direction are they going sort of north of 30 degrees north or so? They're going westerly instead. Okay, so up here we have our winds going in this direction. Okay, so these are our winds. So if we think about Ekman transport, okay, in the northern hemisphere, Ekman transport is going to move surface water 90 degrees to the right of those winds. Okay? So if we think about what that would do, that means that we would have surface water moving inwards, okay, 90 degrees to the right of those winds, and also 90 degrees to the right of these winds. Okay? So my surface water is being forced into the middle of my North Atlantic or my North Pacific or whatever else. And so what happens is I build up a little high, a little high in sea level, okay? And so you can imagine it'd be like that, okay? 
And what's going to happen is that water doesn't want to be a hill. You can't pile up water terribly easily. That water is going to try to go from high to low. And as it does that, in the northern hemisphere, it's still deflected by that Coriolis force. It still ends up going to the right. So as water ends up trying to move out of this high sort of sea level, it ends up being deflected to the right. And so our currents end up flowing around and around in the ocean like this. Okay? Does that make sense? Does that help? Second time around? Good. So, if we were to do the same thing in the southern hemisphere, so here are my winds easterly near the equator. Oh. And then westerly down here. This time we're going, our Eggman transport will act at 90 degrees to the left. So it would go down like this. And so all my water would be pushed into the middle of the South Atlantic or the South Pacific or whichever ocean you want to do. So here's our high in the southern part of our ocean. And as our water tries to move out of that high, which way is it going to be deflected in the southern hemisphere? To the left, it's going to go out and to the left. Okay? And so we're going to end up with the currents circulating the other way around. So it acts just like a high pressure system in the northern and southern hemisphere. It's exactly the same ideas behind that. Does that make sense? A little bit? Okay. So, let's see if we have this or not. Evil question of the day. So, which hemisphere is my gyre in? Is it in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere? So, remember, it acts like a high pressure system, right? Okay. Let's see how we did. Very good. Well done, guys. Absolutely. It's the southern hemisphere. Because if you imagine that there's a high in the middle there, it's going out and which direction? To the left. Okay? So it's not as bad as you might think to begin with. Okay? It follows a lot of the same rules as our high pressure systems. You just have to get that idea of those easterly, westerly winds and the fact that Ekman transport means that um, we get water forced to the middle of our oceans. So let's take a look at our gyres. Here is a map of our big ocean gyres, and you can see we have one, two, three, four, five of them. We have one in the North Pacific, we have one in the South Pacific, we have one in the North Atlantic, we have one in the South Atlantic, and we have one in the Indian Ocean. Okay? And you can see that they follow our nice rules. You can see that in the North Pacific, that subtropical gyre, okay, you can see that it's going in a which way is that? Clockwise direction, right? Just like our high pressure should. Same for the Atlantic. In our southern ocean ones, the Indian Ocean, South Atlantic, sub, uh, South Pacific, you can see it goes counterclockwise. Yep. It's following those same rules. Okay, so what can seem like just a random pattern of arrows, it's following these fundamental guidelines that sort of, in a, in a way, govern the same way that our atmosphere moves. Okay. So now you can see that we have particular patterns of where we're going to have warm water moving from the equator to the poles and where we have cold water moving from the poles to the equator. And that affects our climate. Okay? But before that, I promised you the garbage patch, right? So in our North Pacific, you can see that we have these circular movements of currents. And it's the same that is true in any of our gyres. And what that means is that once things end up in these gyres, they tend to keep circulating around. And that Eggman transport moves stuff into the middle of those gyres. Okay? And so all of that stuff that falls off our container ships or that we dump in the oceans, if it gets caught in these gyres, it collects. It doesn't tend to escape very often. And that's why we have a big garbage patch in the middle of our Pacific Ocean. And it's why we end up with poor little turtles like that. Um, and why we end up with seabirds 
that eat a lot of this plastic, in particular, plastic doesn't break down terribly quickly, and it looks, when it's floating in the ocean, just like a jellyfish or something particularly edible, um, but of course it isn't. Um, and especially if you've been following the stuff about the, the plane that they lost um, and is off sort of South Australia somewhere, they kept finding stuff floating in the ocean, right? And they're like, we found it. No, we haven't. We found it. No, we haven't. And it's because there's a huge bunch of garbage basically just floating around in these gyres in our oceans. So, on a happier note, these gyres affect our climate. They keep our climate really nice and cool because you can see that along our coastline, the flow of that gyre brings cold water down from further north past us, keeps us nice and cool. On the other side of the Pacific, you can see that on that side, we have warm water moving from the equator up. Okay, and so that tends to keep that sort of side of that continent much sort of warmer and more humid. Okay, so tell me, according to my little diagram there, according to the flow of those gyres, which is going to be the more humid, warmer coastline? Is it going to be Western Africa or, s or Eastern South America? So three quarters of people are with me, which is a good sign. So Eastern South America, can you see that there's a red arrow flowing down past that coastline? And you can see that if we pick the same latitude, if we go, say, here, then you can see that we're in these warmer orange colors. If you follow that same latitude along to Africa, we're in cooler colors, okay? And what you can see is that we have a cold current moving in this direction along the coastline that brings cooler uh, sort of water past, and that means that it's gonna be cooler along the coast and less humid, there's less evaporation going on. Whereas on this side, we have warm water sort of as part of this sort of circular gyre system coming back from the equator towards the pole. And so warmer water is flowing down the coast here. Um, and so it's going to be warmer. There's going to be more evaporation. It's going to be more humid. OK. And that is true of our coastline as well. We have the California current flowing past us, keeps us cool. If you go to the east coast, especially in the middle of summer, it's really humid. It's really quite warm, and that's because they have the Gulf Stream, this really warm current that comes out of that Gulf of uh, Mexico and flows northwards. More about that in a second. Okay. So other currents that I would like you to be aware of are the equatorial currents. Okay. How much Coriolis force is there at the equator? None. There is no Coriolis force at the equator. And there is one of the only places where life is nice and simple because the wind blows uh, from the east to the west, and that's the way the water goes as well. Okay, it's nice and simple. Um, the other place that we get um, something a little bit different is in the Southern Ocean, and because that's in the Southern Ocean, we don't see continents getting in the way. The, the water can move with the wind pretty easily. So that's a little bit different from our gyres. So now let's think about our deep ocean circulation. It may not be wind-driven, but it does have a big influence on our climate system, and so we do want to think about it. So our deep ocean circulation is density-driven, so it's no longer wind-driven, it's density-driven. And we call it the thermohaline circulation. And why do we do that? Because the two things that control its density, or water's density, are the temperature, thermo, and its salinity, how salty it is, haline, okay? So the clue is in the name, thermohaline. Those are the two sort of properties of water that control its density and control whether things will stay near the surface or whether they can sink in our oceans. And really, this is the way that 90% of the water in our oceans moves, and so we do really care about that. It may not be really super fast currents like we see at the surface, they may only go sort of 10, 20 kilometers a year, but we still care about that. So if we want to think about sort of how we can get water to sink and how we can change the density, then the clue is that cold and salty are the most dense. Warm and fresh is the least dense. So if I gave you a bottle of water from the very bottom of our oceans, do you think it would be warm or cold? 
cold, would it be salty or fresh? Thank you, yes. Because the most dense stuff is going to be at the bottom. It's like if you try and pour honey on top of water, the honey will end up sinking down to the bottom because it's heavier, it's denser. Okay? And so we form these layers in our ocean. And so here is a picture of our thermohaline circulation or our ocean conveyor. And you can see that those red sort of lines on my map show surface currents, lovely warm surface currents. The blue shows cold, salty currents that flow right at the very bottom of our ocean, right at the bottom of that four kilometers or so of the ocean. And to go, and you can see that it's sort of all connected in this big loop. And to go around that loop once takes the ocean about 1,500 years or so. It's a really slow loop, but it's a very important way of moving heat and energy around. And so the important thing for us is that we can see a few places where that water can get cold and salty enough to start sinking. And you can see that, unsurprisingly, it's near the poles. So up here, we can get these two little areas where surface water can be really cold and it can get salty enough that it can sink right from the surface down to that four kilometers depth or so. And then as it sort of sinks, it starts to flow down through the Atlantic and then it forms this sort of deep, cold current. The other couple of places we can see deep water forming is down here, this sort of purple area here, purple area here. It's also really cold. Um, and that can get salty as well, and that's where we start to see water sinking. And I want to point out to you that for us at least, especially for where I am from, up here, then we really care about whether water is sinking here or not. Because you can see that really most of those warm currents are in this section of the ocean. They're in relatively sort of warm areas, but wherever we have these purple areas, warm surface water is pulled really far towards the pole. So up in the Atlantic, if we didn't have this cold water sinking, then we wouldn't pull nice warm surface water to replace it up that far. It would instead just sort of carry on and turn around and maybe head back down again. And the same goes for the Southern Ocean as well. You can see that where we have these areas of sinking water, warm surface water is pulled much closer to the pole than it otherwise would be. And so it moves heat much closer to the pole than it otherwise would. So why am I telling you this? Okay, Because it transports so much heat, and so it has a big impact on our climate. And so we want to know a couple of things. Could this circulation change? And what could cause it to change? Okay, And so what do you think might cause it, uh, that water in the North Atlantic to become less dense? What could cause that water to become less dense and so less likely to sink to make deep water? So let's take a look. 60% of people agree. OK, good. So the idea is, is that, yes, if we melt land ice, are we going to make the water in the North Atlantic fresher or saltier? Fresher. If we melt lots of ice on Greenland and that fresh water runs into the ocean, it's going to make it fresher, and so it's going to be less dense. If we warm the ocean up, because we're warming our air temperatures right now, again, it's going to be warmer, it's going to be less dense. So both of those things contribute to seawater in the, the North Atlantic right now becoming a little bit less dense. And as it becomes less dense, it doesn't sink as easily. And this is our day after tomorrow scenario, right? So if you watch the movie again, there's, a, there's a, a phrase that I love. It's like, we've hit a critical desalinization point. Listen for it next time. And it's because it's talking about that water in the North Atlantic and the fact that it's hit this point where it becomes too fresh to sink. And so their scenario has the whole thermohaline circulation shutting down in three days. Doesn't do that, OK? But there is an element of truth to it. That thermohaline circulation may not shut down in three days. It may not freeze New York completely. But it has been shown to shut down in the past. And we see really huge, dramatic swings in temperature in perhaps as little as 10 years or less, which is really astounding. We see swings of maybe 15 degrees Celsius on Greenland. That's a huge difference. 
Okay? That's easily turning the, the temperatures of Mississippi into something like sort of Arctic Canada. Okay? So this is sort of uh, a little bit of evidence from the past. So if we go out into the North Atlantic, right in the middle of the North Atlantic, and we look at the sediment that we can find, we see that every now and again in our sediment cores that we take, we see coarser bits of sort of sand or gravel. The only way that we can get something that big out into the middle of the North Atlantic is to have that material frozen into icebergs. Those icebergs break off the, the glaciers on land, they float out into the Atlantic, they gradually melt and they dump all of the gravel and the rocks that they were holding and they sort of fall to the bottom. And we can see these layers. We can see that there are times when we saw huge numbers of icebergs coming into the North Atlantic and they would melt and they release fresh water. And at the same time we see these big sort of chunks of, of rock and sand, we can also see that on Greenland, in the ice cores that we'll talk about later this quarter, we can see massive swings in temperature. So you can see that, say for the last 10,000 years or so, this graph sort of shows a representation of temperature. So closer towards the top is warmer. So this is the last 10,000 years or so. You can see it's really been very, very stable and it's been relatively warm. But as we go back in time, you can see that we see these enormous jumps in temperature and these are associated with the appearance of these little um, sort of bits of rock in the, the Atlantic. So we know that this circulation can switch off. And what does that do to temperatures? This is what happens if we get our computer models and we tell it to switch off the thermohaline circulation. You can see that it does get an awful lot cooler around the North Atlantic. It gets maybe sort of four or five degrees Celsius colder, which is a lot colder, okay? It would make sort of agriculture different, difficult in some parts of northern Europe, perhaps. Okay? So it's theoretically possible, right? But you don't have to worry too much. Okay? Because unlike during the last ice age, when we saw these big dramatic swings, we just don't have enough fresh water up there at our poles right now. We can't release enough of it quickly enough for us to completely shut down that circulation. But what we can do is start reducing the strength of that circulation. And that's what is estimated to happen in the next few decades. We are starting to see a reduction in the amount of uh, deep water formation and the speed of that and the strength of that thermohaline circulation. And so it's a really interesting question what that might that do to temperatures around the North Atlantic. But there's still a certain amount of uncertainty that we would like to understand more about. So that's our thermohaline circulation. Um, it may not be wind-driven, but it's important. So lastly, let's talk about El Nino. Who's heard of El Nino? Everybody, right? Absolutely. Who's heard of it in the context of this year? A couple of people who see the news. OK. So what is El Nino? What drives it? Most people have heard El Nino. They know it's something to do with the Pacific Ocean, something to do with weather. But actually, let's think about what it really is. What does it mean when we talk about an El Nino year or, or an El Nino event? So an El Nino event is a warming of the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. And it happens, in general, every three to seven years. Um, and we have a certain amount of understanding, um, but it's something that we find very, very difficult to predict on the long term. Sort of, sort of decades ahead, and it's something that we would like to be able to, to model much better in our climate models. So we've talked a lot about the circulation of the atmosphere north-south. We've talked about our Hadley cells, our feral cells, our uh, polar cells, but we also have something in the Pacific which is east-west instead of north-south, and this is called the Walker circulation. And the idea is, is that we tend to have these easterly winds which fit with our nice three-cell conceptual model. We have, tend to have easterly winds moving along the equator up in the Pacific as part of this Walker circulation, which forms this cell where air rises over the continents and it sinks over that coastline just at the edge of uh, South America and the Pacific. So let's have a look at what happens. So this is what we would normally see in an average year in the Pacific, especially in the tropical Pacific. 
So South America, North America on the right hand side, Australia on the left. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff on here. First of all, I want you to concentrate on the green arrows. So the green arrows are our walker circulation and it shows the winds flowing nicely easterly along the equator. And do you remember, how much Coriolis force do we have at the equator? None. And so if our wind is flowing east or uh, towards the west along the equator, which way does the water go? It goes the same way as the wind, right? Okay. So if you think that we have our lovely surface water around the equator in the tropics, it's being warmed up by energy arriving from the sun. But all of that nice warm surface water is getting blown sideways, it's getting blown along until it hits the coastline um, of Australia in the, the, so the Western Pacific. Okay, does that make sense so far? Everyone with me? So now let's think back to our upwelling, downwelling. If we're blowing all of our surface water away from the coast of South America, what do we have happening? Upwelling. Upwelling. It's even written on the diagram for you. Okay? So if we're moving all of our surface water away, we're going to have upwelling going on. Okay? And that brings lots of nice nutrients, but it also brings colder water to the surface. So our normal pattern in the, the Pacific Ocean is cold on the Eastern Pacific, warm in the Western Pacific. And where do we tend to get more evaporation, where it's cold or where it's warm? Where it's warm. So where is most of our rainfall going to be? In the Western Pacific, okay? Whereas it's relatively dry over that cold area of sea surface temperatures in the, the Pacific, okay? So there's a word on there that you haven't seen before, and that's the thermocline. That is just the boundary between warm surface water and cold, deeper water. Okay, that's all that that means, that thermocline. Okay, so that's our normal conditions. That's normally what you would see. That's probably what it's like right now. So now let's think about El Nino. So this is what happens in an El Nino year. You can see it looks very different. So first of all, our lovely cold water in the Eastern Pacific has disappeared. So why has it disappeared? Well, what direction are the winds going? They're going the other way, right? Instead of going to the west, as, as, instead of being on normal easterly winds, they've actually weakened and they're actually going the other way. So which way are those winds carrying nice warm surface water? This way, okay? So are we gonna have any upwelling off South America? No, because wind is not moving that water. If anything, that water is being moved towards um, South America. So now, where is our nice warm water? It's no longer being pushed against Australia. It's still warm over there, but it's not being pushed against the coastline. And so we get drier conditions over Indonesia, over Australia. We get drought in those El Nino years on that side, and we get much wetter conditions near South America. And not only near South America, but we here in California get much wetter conditions during El Nino years. It would be a really good thing for us if El Nino arrived because we really need that water um, for here, us here in California. But for the fisheries industry of South America, that is not a good thing because they're not getting that upwelling, they're not getting nutrient-rich water coming to the surface, so their fisheries industries collapse. What about La Nina? Everyone's heard of El Nino. Not many people have heard of La Nina. La Nina is the reverse state, okay? So now we have basically just like normal, but it's extra normal, okay? It's extra strong normal. So we have even stronger winds moving that water, that warm water, even further across. We have even more upwelling over on this coast. So we have even colder waters, it's even drier in the Eastern Pacific, okay? Lots of good upwelling, lots of good life. So why do you care? Oh, hang on. There, there was normal. And there you can see that's extra strong, that La Nina conditions. So why do we care? Okay. So first of all, tell me, show to me that you are paying attention. In which years do easterly trade winds weaken or reverse? 
So here you can see El Nino, normal, and La Nina conditions. So have a look. Which years do my easterly trade winds weaken or reverse? OK. Please don't pack up just yet. I have five minutes left to go. Thank you. Right, let's see. At least 80% of people were paying attention to me. Absolutely. Spot the odd one out. Those white arrows represent winds. And you can see that in my normal La Nina years, those winds are going easterly. In my El Nino years, those winds go the other direction. So tell me, in which years would there be most upwelling of South America? In which years would we see most productive ecosystems, lots and lots of life, lots of good fishing? OK, let's take a look. Slightly less people with me, but they would be right. It would be La Nina years. OK. So why should you care? Why should you care what is happening in the eastern tropical Pacific? It's one tiny part of the world. Well, the Pacific is an enormous ocean. And so what's happening in the eastern Pacific is going to affect all of these different countries in different ways. So for example, you can see that when during El Nino years we have really horrible droughts and fires in Australia and parts of Indonesia. We have corals dying off. Um, along around the Galapagos, we have uh, fisheries uh, that really do very badly um, along California and our US coastline as well as South America. Um, we see huge amounts of rainfall in California um, and we see flooding in parts of South America and also even drought as far as Africa. It's a long way from the Pacific, but the Pacific is huge. What happens in the Pacific matters. And it also matters if you look at global temperatures. So everyone hears every year that this year was the fifth warmest on record or whatever else. Um, but El Nino is a strong enough phenomenon, it's a strong enough change in the surface heat of the Earth that it actually affects our global temperatures. So this shows you, um, sort of basically relative to sort of normal, which is zero, how warm or cold each of those years were over the past, say, 1950 to 2012. And in red, you can see El Nino years. And in blue, you can see La Nina years. So red El Nino years tend to be much warmer than normal. La Nina years tend to be much colder than normal. And so you can see that in particular, look at the last, say, 10, 15 years. We've really been stuck in pretty normal or La Nina-like conditions. So we haven't had a strong El Nino event since 97, 98. Look what happened that year. We had a huge hugely hot year, okay? And so the question is, is this the year? And we're getting to a point where is anything probably from, I don't know, 60 to 80% actually likely that we're going to move into an El Nino later this year. And we don't know how strong it's going to be, but it could potentially be quite strong. And so that's good news for California in terms of water, but it's pretty bad news for everyone else. And you can see, well, yeah. <laughs> Um, and you can see that, uh, especially off the coast of South America right now, that's really where it's beginning. So a review for those of you that want to review. Um, we, did, we talked about the different ways the ocean and atmosphere can interact. You can read through that. So I'll see you on Tuesday.